Hello everybody. Okay, we're back with the finish up the little one tube amplifier. Last video we did the key in circuit and the, the uh, cathode circuit is actually part of the relay here. The wire around the relay and the key in circuit the sample cap right here these two diodes right here this capacitor right here I probably can't see it but the little 1k resistors hiding right here on this tab transistor and what I've actually added I finished up the uh, coax from the relay to the load condenser and that would be this wire right here. Now one thing I didn't explain uh, after looking at the video last time that I see I didn't explain the parasitic choke. The parasitic choke is a 68 ohm resistor 1 watt they call it a flame proof resistor and it's not wire wound this is a non-inductive resistor and there's three turns of wire, copper wire, uh, I think it's about 20 gauge copper wire, three turns of wire wrapped around that. And that's why the symbol is a resistor and a coil, shorten it out. Just three turns of wire across that. And what this does, it keeps the tube from breaking into what they call VHF oscillations, parasitics. Keeps it a little cleaner. The plate choke, I didn't explain either, sorry. Um, this is an old power resistor. I think it was like a 4 watt resistor. Um, I think I've got one here. Yeah. It looked just like this when I started. Took it to a grinder. Very carefully ground off the layer of coating and the metal film on it. Inside, some of them have a Pyrex glass rod and, uh, others have a ceramic and it's just a easy form to make a, a choke out of and that's uh, 26 gauge wire I wound as many turns as I could on there it's not critical uh, as long as you get it about an inch and a half worth of turns you could also use a quarter inch wooden dowel and do the same thing uh, you would want approximately inch and three-fourths to uh, two inches of windings and it's close wound just as close as you can get the turns uh, side by side um, there are some commercial uh, chokes available I think I used to see a lot I don't know if their company's probably not even around but they were called a Z14 they were uh, orange uh, others were yellow I don't know if I have, I think I do. Yeah, this thing looks just like a resistor. Uh, this one's called, uh, what has it got, numbers? It's made by Ohmite. That's called a Z24, but same idea. It's just a ceramic form with wire wrapped around it. You see, it's almost identical to what I've got in there. Uh, the Omite was the company that made them. You might still be able to find. Uh, they're roughly uh, 20 microhenry, 17 microhenry, just like this one. Anything in that neighborhood will work. Um, I didn't have to change any of the coil. You see it's setting real close. We're going to fire it up. And uh, I just soldered the coax, grounded the coax to the chassis, run it back to the relay, grounded the coax shield on that end, and then the center conductor is on the uh, normally open contact of the relay. So when the relay closes, it makes a connection from the antenna to that contact. So it hooks the antenna up to it. So, 
we'll go ahead and uh, turn the power supply on here. Oh, yeah, and I also hooked the 24 volts to the relay. Give it a bit to warm up. I think you can see, hopefully, yeah, the meter. Give the tube a minute or so here to warm up. Okay, we'll key it up now. Well, we got about 30 watts already. Just a little bit. Yeah, just a smidge and over 40 watts is what it's reading on the meter. So see, is able to guess it pretty close by using the dummy load on this end and just feeding five watts back through it. Um, when your amp gets more complicated, you'll need to take into consideration the uh, capacitance of the plate, and th that'll be listed on the tube chart. It'll say C out, and it'll be like 11 picofarad, 14 picofarad, whatever. And you'll have to substitute that uh, from your from this end on your tune cap to ground. You'll want to put that across your resistor. That'll be uh, added to what they consider stray capacitance. Um, this lead, yes, it's a little long, but for one tube and maybe even two tubes, I can get away with that. Um, with more power, this would cause a problem. Uh, this l length of wire is long enough to absorb a signal from the output that you could get oscillations or feedback and the thing would act up, act weird. Uh, so then you'd want to use coax in that. But this is, that's about four inches there. Um, I'm going to do one more thing because uh, with one tube driving it with a 5 watt radio there is some going to be some SWR and when we get this tuned I'm going to put a coil and cap on here so there will be a tuned input right now it's just a choke input that's untuned and it'll probably be a there's probably a 2 uh, about a 2 SWR with a uh, tuned coil you can zero that out to a 1 to 1 and that will also probably get the power up by a little over 50 watts because it will be a, a better match from the radio to the tube. Two tubes you can almost get away with it because then your input resistance starts coming down. Oh, well, that was another thing I was going to mention. Um, the resistance on the plate, it will say plate or load impedance, load resistance. Uh, and it varies from tube to tube. When the tubes get bigger, that resistance is going to be lower. If you put two of these tubes in parallel, this one here, uh, it listed at 9,900. Two of them in parallel, it would be half that value. So closer to 5,000 ohms, 4,800, somewhere in there. Uh, so that's the resistor you'd start off with if you was going to set this up for two tubes. And that will, again, leave you where when you get the SWR and these two matched with that resistor in place, you won't have to tune very much. Uh, there won't be much difference between the load and tune uh, when you actually hook the tube up and put everything together. One other trick um, I'm going to show on the next video there's a little trick that a company years ago that made amps their name was Brewer Labs 
they call they had like the varmint linears there's a trick that they did where they had a switch on the front panel and I think it was labeled super mod well what they did is they just simply left the screen or suppressor grid they left it connected to ground but they disconnected the control grid and the screen grid they tied those two together but not at ground and on full power high power that would just be connected to ground but when they'd kick the super mod switch there would be a resistor tied in between those in other words they'd be tied together still but there'd be a, uh, maybe a one two maybe even a 4k resistor I forget the exact value I will have to experiment and find that and then electrolytic capacitor to ground and the capacitor was in parallel with the resistor and it uh, worked by virtue of when there's audio going through the tube the grids tended to rectify out voltage and so you actually got a voltage increase across that cap with audio so as you modulate your modulation would swing way forward it would be relaxed at maybe uh, one-third of the output and so they usually put this in the driver stage so when you kick that switch on you'd go from four or five hundred watts maybe back to fifty watts and as you modulate the thing would swing from fifty all the way up to five hundred it was crazy but that's how they did it with a capacitor an electrolytic capacitor and a resistor and they just experimented with the value you could do this with any tube uh, there's no one tube that won't work that way uh, and it's another way of turning your power up and down if you didn't need the uh, carrier and modulation increase you could just simply use a resistor of a little less value and it would drop your output so you could make a high and low it's an easy way to make a high and low output with a grounded grid or gra actually it's cathode driven but grounded grid circuit is this what this is called grounded grid once you get but get up into the better tubes um, the pentodes tetrodes I like instead of grounded grid or cathode driven I like to grid drive them into what's called class AB1 you'll get a cleaner output and it's much easier to control the output because you can control the screen voltage controlling the screen voltage will act a lot like turning the volume control up and down on say an audio amplifier you can just dial the wattage right where you want it from full anywhere down to you know two or three watts and it's a really slick way of controlling the power um, you'll see a lot of circuits ignore that especially in the handbooks they're like oh that's crazy you can't you can't change the screen voltage but yes you can and it works and it doesn't give that bad of uh, distortion it's still clean and it's just a way of making the tube relax on those you have bias on the control grid grid number one but grid number two the screen voltage they uh, they can lower the voltage uh, you can either do it with steps or you can use like a little tiny tiny variac so that you can dial it up or down okay that's about it for now um, like I say on my next video well uh, I got to experiment with this exact thing this is going to be kind of fiddly so I won't stretch the video out while I'm doing it I'll get it figured out and then show you what I've done and give you the parameters uh, for a single tube and a tune circuit and then also I'll have the uh, the grid pins like I gotta maybe put a little panel or maybe I can mount a switch up here and I can show you that super mod thing on this one so thank you for watching this video and if you have any questions or if you didn't get a uh, want a schematic of the whole thing um, the schematic for the full linear is this one this is a two tube two six jm sixes and except for the power supply the schematics there are ready to go the way it's supposed to be wired up so send me an email these are all in jpeg 
um, something I also might add is that uh, I do the JPEGs in PC Paint. Uh, I don't have a drawing program that draws schematics. I actually take a JPEG and with Paint's uh, properties they have a an area, a little uh, tool that you can select and copy and paste and move. Uh, then it's got the draw thing where you can draw the lines between parts. And if anybody's interested in that, if I get enough interest, um, I'll I'll try to do a video just for that and show you my process. There's even a um, a nice uh, internet link online. It's called PDF to Image. So if you download a PDF file and you want to get a JPEG of it so you can work with it, because Paint won't work with anything but JPEGs or um, what is it, PNG images, but JPEGs usually is what I work with. Anyhow, pdf to imagecom uh, you go to it, it has a little tool there that says select or upload, you upload your file and it'll process it and then download it and it'll let you know when it's ready to download, it takes just a few minutes and it's, it's done. And then you can go in and what it does, it makes each page a separate JPEG. So, uh, in other words, it doesn't make it one complete JPEG. Each page is a separate JPEG. So it makes it easy to work with. So if you have a manual, you can ignore the pages that are just writing and you can go right to the schematic part of it and uh, select the schematic you want and start uh, pulling parts apart. You can save them as a file. Uh, that's how I do it. I find something, a schematic that's good and clean. I'll save each component out separately uh, as a capacitor, a variable capacitor, or a resistor, or a diode. I save them all out. And that's how I get the, uh, that's how I get all the, I don't have to draw these. And you won't find a library for this. Uh, well, I started and they were just, they were really lame. So I just started uh, creating my own. Okay guys, thank you, and uh, we'll see you on the next video.